Can you believe that it is week 10 in college football already? It feels like the season has absolutely flown by. And we have huge matchups this weekend that are going to impact the college football playoff. And we're going to get the first official committee rankings on Tuesday. So that's exciting. And I bet you they look a lot like the Unafraid Show rankings if the committee gets it right. But this weekend, the matchups are going to impact who makes the college football playoff. Because there are still 30 teams at least that still have a viable chance of making it to their conference championship game. And if you make it to the conference championship game, you are guaranteed to get in the top four if you can win your conference and you finish in the highest ranked top four of the conference. Now, you guys make sure that you like, subscribe, get notifications, and most importantly, tell a friend about the Unafraid Show. We are damn near at 20,000 subs, and it is because of you guys liking, sharing, leaving comments, and everything else because the show will continue to grow because of you people out there. And thanks so much. But we got to get to the business. We got work to do. We are going to start with the game of the week. Ohio State minus three and a half at Penn State. Boy, oh boy, this is a doozy because the amount of pressure on both of these coaches and on both of these fan bases is absolutely immense because they know how much this game matters, how important it is, and the fact that the records in this game exactly haven't been that great in terms of top five games for their head coaches. Now, you've seen all the stats. They are absolutely true. And if you haven't, let me refresh your memory a little bit. So Ohio State coach Ryan Day, he has not beaten a top five opponent since September 3rd, 2022. Now, for some teams, depending on who you are, you may not have played a top five team, but he has. He has lost four straight. And Ryan Day is two and six versus top five teams. And then when you add in the first Oregon game that was in uh, the, the shoe as well, it ain't a good record right now. Now, on the other hand, James Franklin, Penn State's head coach, he hasn't beaten a top five opponent since October 22nd, 2006. He's lost 10 straight because, you know, he's had an opportunity to play more because he's played Michigan and he's played Ohio State a bunch of times. Now, James Franklin is 1-9 versus Ohio State. And James Franklin is 3-17, and 17, not only versus top uh, five teams, but versus top 10 teams. And why am I using the head coach's names instead of the school names? That's because the way that their own frustrated fan bases have been talking. They're like, Ryan Day ain't beat nobody. James Franklin ain't beat nobody. Uh, not we haven't beat anybody, but it's they are looking at it like this is solely the coach's fault. And after last week when Ohio State barely escaped Nebraska, we've had a whole week of doom and gloom out in Columbus. People calling for Ryan Day's job. They don't like the defensive line rotations. They don't like anything that this dude is bringing. And so they are nervous. That is a nervous habit. Now, how many times have we seen people? Right. When they get a little nervous about something, they start lashing out at other people. Oh, dude, you did this. You did. Mm -mm -mm, because internally they feeling it. They're feeling that pressure. And that's exactly what's happening to Ohio State fans right now. And then you got Penn State fans. They're already pre mourning a loss right now. That hasn't even happened because their starting quarterback, Drew Aller. He may not even play because he has a leg injury. Now, I'm not sure why they'd even think that he would have been one to make a big difference anyway, because he hasn't. He's been a cool quarterback, but he hasn't been exceptional to the fact that, like, you're like, damn, we're 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 missing our Cam Ward right here. We're missing our uh, Dylan Gabriel. We're missing somebody who's going to make certain amount of plays that we don't feel like that anybody else in the country can make. And the bottom line is. These are two very good teams that deserve to be ranked in the top five. But because they haven't gotten over the hump, they are going to be miserable until they do. This game this weekend is in Happy Valley. But Ohio State, they're not afraid of that environment because Ryan Day has to be looking at how USC had five explosive plays for almost 200 yards against this Penn State team, who is a very good defense. And then Ryan Day has to be thinking to himself, hmm, that Chip Kelly 
offensive genius mastermind has to be able to orchestrate something to get that same level of production. And when you think about this Ohio State team and these running backs, Quinshawn Judkins, uh, Trayvon Henderson, bro, this is legacy game time. It is time to do it. And uh, Mecca Egbuka, uh, Jeremiah Smith, yeah, this is their time to shine. The question is, is Bo Prabula, Penn State's backup quarterback, if he has to play, is he a difference maker? Or is this a an offense that is not capable of doing that? Now, I am also looking at their, their tight end, Ty Waller. The kid is a baller. Love to watch him play. And he absolutely scorched USC for 224 yards, I think on 17 catches. It was an unreal performance. Now, the question is, can Ohio State stop him? And can Prabula, if he has to play, can he be special? Because that's been the difference between Penn State winning these games and losing these games is having a quarterback who cannot just be efficient and not turn the ball over once every 92 passes like Drew Aller is doing. No, it is somebody who can take the next step and be special. So the question is, will it be Will Howard? and the Buckeyes' uh, offensive weapons that are able to be the most special, or will it be Drew Aller and his running game and their their tight end who's going to be the difference maker in this game? And I'm telling you, with this three-and-a-half-point spread, sorry, Penn State fans, I got to take the Buckeyes because, yes, they looked bad last week, but there's no way they lose this game too, right? All right, next game up. We got Arkansas hosting Ole Miss, and Ole Miss is a six-point favorite. Believe it or not, Sam Pittman, Arkansas's head coach, who came into season on the hot seat, who lost the game to Oklahoma that they should not have lost, he is two wins away from a winning season and two SEC wins away from his best conference record since he's been at Arkansas. And just one week after, LSU completely erased Arkansas's running game. The Razorbacks got healthy against Mississippi State to the tune of 360 yards on the ground. Now, they're going to need another heroic effort in the running game to get past number 19 Ole Miss, who hasn't allowed a single opponent to average more than three and a half yards per attempt this year. Now, Ole Miss is confounding this season. You look at them and you're like, you're supposed to be better, but they're not. They're first in scoring defense and their passing game is electric. First in the SEC in passing yards per game and fourth in the country. Yet of the eight teams averaging at least 320 passing yards per game, Ole Miss is last in overall touchdown passes and tied for 29th in the country. And the, like, they're even behind Auburn. Like, what kind of, like, how? So, why can't Ole Miss finish drives? How is this the team that is one loss away from kissing any shot of the college football playoff goodbye, despite being as good on paper of uh, potential NFL players than they have in a very, very long time? And that's on both sides of the ball. Now, it's probably because they're 81st in red zone efficiency, which is what makes this game against Arkansas interesting because Sam Pittman's defense is only allowing 69% of drives that reach the red zone to get any points of any kind over the last three games. And that could be a recipe for trouble for the Ole Miss Rebels and a bunch of field goals. And then that will give Arkansas the fast opportunity to keep this game close. So give me Arkansas and give me the six points. Next game up. Oh, Oregon Ducks. They head out to the big house to face big, bad, vaunted Michigan and 100,000 people. Now, Oregon is favored in this game by 14 and a half points, but this one is supposed to be a doozy. Now, there are two schools of thought, right? There are a bunch of people that think that Oregon is going to absolutely roll in this game and not giving Michigan a shot. And then there's the people that are like, yo, yo, th 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 this Oregon team, this is fool's gold. This team is not physical. This team is a finesse team, and they're just out there doing their thing. And I'm like, have you watched the Ducks play? Have you watched the level of physicality? There's a term that I like to use. When I, when I say a team looks good getting off the bus, now, Oregon previously, when they went to the national championship in 2014 and 2010, yes, they had some dudes, right? But there is a difference when this team gets off the bus. Their, their defensive uh, ends look like D tackles. 
the D, uh, the linebackers looked like DNs. And the corners looked like safeties. Safeties looked like small linebackers. This is the way the team is set up. And this is the way elite teams look when they get off the bus. Now, let's analyze this game, though, because obviously this game is much bigger for Oregon than it is for Michigan, because Michigan is a team that it, it that everybody knows that's watching. They've had quarterback trouble. They've lost three games already. They've got a new head coach in Sharon Moore. Jim Harbaugh is gone. Connor Stallions is gone. All sorts of stuff is gone. So this is a whole different football team than won the national championship last year. Now, this week, Michigan got some news. Their quarterback, who has played some this year, Jack Tuttle, he's now retired. He has cited injuries, and he's like, I'm not going to be able to come back. So now the Wolverines, they've seemed to move to a two-quarterback system where Alex Orgy, he runs the ball, doesn't throw the ball, and Davis Warren, former walk-on, he's the one who throws it. Now, it sounds like Michigan is going to get the benefit of Khalil Mullings their star running back, their best running back right now, who's playing better than Donovan Edwards. He'll be in the backfield this week, despite video evidence showing that he stomped people in a scrum after the win over the Michigan State Spartans. Now, it was clear as day when you see it that something happened, and Michigan State is upset because they wanted the same treatment that their players got two years ago when they got in the fight. Now, I do believe that tempers will flare a little bit because Michigan players are not going to want to come around and get pushed around by the by those soft West Coast teams. Well, Oregon's a very prideful team. So watch that locker room thing flare up again. Not maybe in the same way, but there will be a little bit of jawing and a little bit of talking. I'm telling you that right now. And you got uh, Derek Harmon former Michigan State uh, defensive lineman who's over at Oregon as well. So there's going to be some jaw in there because they've played many a times. Now, on a side note, Michigan does need to fix this tunnel situation. I know that they have an old stadium, but they got to figure it out because there have been too many incidents over the years, and one of these times somebody is going to get hurt. Now, Sharon Moore, he said that Mullings, that he was just trying to be a superhero and break things up. What? That ain't what happened on film. And he's going to have to be a literal superhero, though, against the Ducks if they want to win. Because this game is going to be on his shoulders and that offensive line's shoulders. And the best shot that the Wolverines have is to keep the ball away from Oregon's offense, which is ninth in yards per game, sixth in yards per play, and 13th in points per play, and ninth in average margin of victory on the season in the nation. So that lets you know that you want to sustain drives if you are Michigan. Drive up and down the field. Keep the ball out of Oregon's hands. Hopefully force a turnover or two and then get some three and outs. Tackle well. That's their keys to victory. This Oregon offense is serious business. Very serious business. But if Michigan is going to have a shot, it's going to be because Oregon's quarterback, Dylan Gabriel, literally gives the Wolverines extra offensive opportunities. It means he's missing throws throwing a pick, fumbling, something like that. And as efficient as Gabriel has been this year, completing 76% of his passes, he has thrown five picks. And that's equal to what Oregon had as a team in 14 games in 2023. Now, two of them came in one game, and they were kind of nasty against Michigan State in the red zone. And he threw a pick in the red zone against UCLA. But it seems like since then, clean those things up that those were – aberrations as opposed to something that you have to be worried about with him and this Michigan team is not a team that you want to give extra possessions to because they will hold the ball because they are three cloud uh, three yards four yards and a cloud of dust and it's not like Oregon's run defense has been impenetrable they've given up almost 500 yards rushing over the last three weeks combined in Big Ten games now, they have been able to get stops when it mattered the most, but they did give up some gashes to Michigan State, and they did give up a couple of gashes to Ohio State as well. Just the truth. And against per Purdue, they were, I mean, they were essentially running the triple option, but still. But I will be taking Oregon to cover this 14 and a half on the road here because it is simple. Absolutely nobody that they have played has shown an ability to slow this offense down. And I do not think it starts this week. I believe that this will be a continuation of a role 
This will probably be a three-score game. The Oregon defense will show up and force Michigan to pass the ball. Because if you force Michigan to throw the ball 30-plus times in a game, you will absolutely win that football game. We got Texas Tech plus 14 and a half at Iowa State. This line is absolutely silly to me. What? Yes, Iowa State is undefeated, but they have the weakest strength of schedule that they've had since 2009 and barely escaped both Iowa and UCF with wins. When you try to find what Iowa State actually does well, it's hard to tell if it's a product of their play or their circumstances. And yes, they're tied for second in the country in passing yards allowed, but the Cyclones have faced five power four offenses who have averaged a combined yards per game rank that is 102nd. And Texas Tech is ranked 23rd. And the Red Raiders are getting Brennan Morton back after he missed the second half of last week's game versus TCU. Also, the Cyclones are below average against the run. And Texas Tech's Taj Boyd is a top three running back in the Big 12 this year. And that should worry anybody wanting to take Iowa State as a two-plus score favorite. Now, I expect a lot of scoring in this game because Texas Tech doesn't exactly play defense either, but I think that this one will be a lot closer than the spread indicates. So give me the Red Raiders plus 14 and a half. Easy work here, people. Easy work. And we got Pittsburgh plus seven and a half at SMU. Bro, this game is for a potential trip to the ACC championship. And Pittsburgh got a lot of big games still coming up on their schedule. But I do have some good news for Pitt this week, though. Redshirt freshman phenom Eli Holstein, their quarterback, he's good to go. He's healthy. He's ready to go. And he'll have a great chance to go off against an SMU defense that just saw Duke. Duke! And TCU both throw for season highs against them. Bro, Duke hasn't done that all year. I know Malik Murphy's doing a good job over there. Bravo to the young kid. But uh, Duke's offense is not exactly the most explosive thing you've ever seen in your life. And Pitt's defense returned three interceptions for touchdowns against Syracuse last week. So you know that secondary, that defense, they out there feeling dangerous. They feeling dangerous. They feeling productive. And hopefully not too overconfident. But it's not really SMU's passing attack that you have to worry about, even though Kevin Jennings is the current ACC leader in yards per completion. Now, the Mustangs, they just lost their star tight end, RJ Maryland, for the season. So they're going to need to rely even more on their multifaceted rushing attack of Jennings, Bouchard Smith, and LJ Johnson. And honestly, I do believe that Pitt can do it in this game. In their last two games, Pitt opponents have carried the ball 69 times for a total of 69 yards. That is double nice, baby. Everybody gets to get everybody gets excited about a little 69, right? <laughs> um, and if SMU has one thing going for it, it's that that their home crowd, they're absolutely going to be buzzing for what is their most important regular season game since Eric Dickerson and Craig James were in uniform over at SMU. This is huge. They're in a big conference in the ACC right now and trying to make a statement and get to the ACC championship game. But to me, Pitt's strength and SMU's weaknesses literally line up perfectly for the Panthers to cover this seven and a half points on the road. Louisville plus 11 and a half at Clemson. Another huge game this week in the world of college football. You guys make sure that you like, subscribe, tell a friend about the Unafraid Show, and most importantly, share. Go down there. Leave a comment real quick. Come on. I'll give, I'll give you a chance. Now, this Cardinals team, they have literally blown every single opportunity to make this a special season. They've had one score losses to Notre Dame, SMU, and Miami. What? You win them games. Now, all of a sudden, you win the college football playoff competition, baby. But now they have the opportunity to play the spoiler and make sure somebody else doesn't get in the ACC championship game. And maybe they'll be able to knock Clemson off their ACC title streak and deny K. Klubnik his shot at a Heisman Trophy or at least to be included in the finalists. Knock him off of that perch as well because Clemson has been beaten up on teams. They have not beat a team this year that has a record above 500. They played three, four, and four teams, and that's it. And Louisville, 
On the other hand, they have found an absolute star in their running back, Isaac Brown, and their quarterback, Tyler Shuck, is on pace for 30 touchdowns. So this is not like this is an offense that has a problem. But the Cardinals' defense might be the defense that you see on K. Klubnick's Heisman Reel because the way that they've been playing. Now, even Georgia Tech and Virginia both threw for 300 yards on these dudes. It is like, it is like you get some yards, you get some yards, you have a career day. That's what it is on this defense. And Clemson, they need this game as part of their Georgia redemption tour after they got absolutely lambasted and shellacked uh, in the beginning of this season. But it's a tough redemption and a tough reputation to shake. Just ask my 2022 Oregon Ducks. And because of the 12-team college football playoff, Clemson will have more than just a regular shot at redemption. It will be more than my Ducks ever did that season. They just got to get through Louisville first. But the question about the pick in this game, though, do we trust Clemson that we've seen who hasn't been playing against really good football teams? Or do we trust Louisville who keeps losing one-score games? I'm going to tell you, I trust Clemson to win this game. But uh, I don't know about that 11 and a half points because uh, when Louisville does lose, it's one score games. We got the former biggest cocktail party in the world in Florida plus 16 and a half against Georgia. And this game is in Jacksonville. And I remember when I was playing for the Jaguars, uh, when this game first came into town, I was like, wow, these people coming around here with all these RVs on a Monday. They were like, Florida-Georgia game. I was like, I don't even understand what this is about. And they were like, bro, you don't understand? This is the biggest game of the year. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, not on the West Coast, pal. <laughs> but I did learn how passionate that these people are. And we also learned that because of upcoming renovations to Everbank Stadium, that this game is going to be hitting the road for two years. And I hate that. Why not? Instead of having it in like Atlanta and then Orlando, why not just do a home and home at the swamp and between the hedges? Why not? Don't you think the fans would love that? Nope. But uh, <laughs> college football, again, will find a way to turn chicken-ish out of chicken salad. But anyways, after what Georgia did to Texas, I am absolutely surprised that this line isn't more than the 16 and a half that it is. And it's not like Bulldogs by 30. Because with Billy Napier's job on the line, it's hard not to think about the fact that Napier is the fifth different Florida coach that Kirby Smart has coached against in the eight years he's been at Georgia. Yes, five different head coaches for Florida in eight years that Kirby Smart has played this game. One school has stability. The other one does not. And the, the Florida fans already want to fire Billy Napier. Hmm. So maybe it's not the coaches. Just saying. Um, now, Florida did just wreck Kentucky. And that was a team that took Georgia to the absolute wire. And Florida got two weeks to prepare to host the Bulldogs. Now, is it possible that the Gators keep this one close? Now, this has been all confusing. Because how exactly? that Florida put up 50 on Kentucky when Georgia couldn't even put up two touchdowns barely. Now, a freshman actually helped out a bit. And not just the freshman that you think, because it wasn't their freshman phenom, number one player in the country, DJ Lagway. It was their running back, Jaden Ball, who got his first, second, third, fourth, and fifth touchdown of his collegiate career against the Wildcats. Now, it is a scary proposition to be reliant upon multiple freshmen going up against George, 100%, because Quinn Ewers got his lunch ate, and so did uh, Arch Manning, who we all believe and have heard is a good quarterback. But for Florida, it's got to be exciting, too, because sometimes with young players, they're too stupid. They're too dumb to realize the gravity of the situation. They're like, we're just going out and go play football. And that can be dangerous because Florida's future, though, could be extremely bright if the incoming administration follows a commitment to hanging on to a coach for more than a couple of years and letting him actually build. After struggling against Kentucky, after taking that loss to Bama, they got their swagger back against Texas in, in a big way. They they running around doing the, doing the Conor McGregor strut right now. 
And they got to find a way to channel that into Carson Beck making plays because he's given the ball away eight times in the last four games. And that's equal to the amount of interceptions that he had thrown in his previous 29 games combined. Now, they can't challenge for a national title without Carson Beck getting back on track. And this is the opportunity against the Gators. However, this game is on neutral territory. For some reason, I'm feeling Florida in my soul. Florida, not to win. Florida plus 16 and a half. And you guys, that is the college football picks against the spread and game previews this week. Make sure that you share it, like it, subscribe it, get notifications, and of course, be back here on Unafraid Show on YouTube, on Twitter, everywhere else, so you guys can hear everything that's going on.